I'm Jonesy, and I've got a bit of a problem. Perhaps I should explain. For those of you not familiar with my channel, let me give you a little bit of context. Much of my content focuses on machining here in my home workshop and documenting my learning journey along the way. And things don't always go to plan, but I have a lot of fun along the way. I build a lot of projects from companies like Hemingway Kits, as well as designing and building my own novel projects, which I make available to my Patreons. I also have a deep interest in unusual machine tools from bygone eras, such as this beautiful Rose engine from the mid 1800s. And there'll be more content featuring these kind of machines in the near future. I'm also planning a series on bicycle frame building, which is another one of my passions. If you think that might be interesting, let me know in the comments. So now you know a bit about me, let's get back to the problem in hand. A couple of months ago, this guy Eric reached out and very kindly asked me if I'd like to be involved in a collaboration between a bunch of YouTube machinists and makers. And there's some really great people involved. There's Quinn from Blondie Hacks, James from Cloud42, Rowan from Not An Engineer, Uri Tuckman, Cronova Engineering, and the list goes on. Now being asked to join this group of people is clearly a fantastic opportunity and a great honor. So what's the problem? Well, I have to make something for this guy. This is Brandon from Inheritance Machining. A few years back, Brandon inherited his machine shop from his grandfather and now designs and makes a variety of well thought out, ingeniously designed and beautifully executed tools. So herein lies the problem. What could I possibly make for Brandon that he hasn't A, already got, or B, just couldn't make for himself and probably to a higher standard that I could anyway? So I started racking my brains and this is my idea. Instead of making something, I'm gonna give him something I know for sure he doesn't already have. I'm gonna bring back to life a piece of engineering history. I found this intriguing looking machine at an auction in a box covered in dust. And at first I wasn't entirely sure what it was. It has this rather complex looking work head, which is adjustable up and down and in and out via lockable slides, which is coupled via a 10 TPI lead screw to this hand wheel arrangement at the end. The hand wheel has graduations on it and it's on a ratchet mechanism with stops. The lead screw is coupled to the work head and advances by the amount set on the hand wheel graduations. I found my first clue to the function of this machine when I spotted this scribing tip. This is free to move in and out and is coupled to this odd looking drum thing, which in turn is coupled to this ratchet mechanism. So what I have here is a linear dividing engine. Linear scales have been used in engineering applications for many, many years indeed. Not just in direct measuring devices, but also in scientific instruments and machine tools of all shapes and sizes, such as this 19th century goniostat from Holtz, Apfel & Co. Before the introduction of modern methods, the laying out and scribing of such fine and evenly spaced lines by hand would have been challenging. And this is what this machine is designed to do. Not only will it ensure the even spacing of lines, but it will also give us the different line lengths every fifth graduation. As a side note, the curved scale that we see here would have been done on a slightly different type of machine, but it's the same principle. I got to thinking about where this machine came from and how old it might be. There are no clues on the machine itself, there's no maker's mark and no date. However, there was a thriving industry in London in the mid 1800s, not only for watches and clocks, but also for scientific instruments and machine tools. And based upon my research, this machine probably dates from that period. It's a really interesting and unusual machine. I've certainly never seen another one like it. If you've got any more information on these kind of machines, please do let me know in the comments. I'd be really interested to hear. Anyway, enough of the waffle. Let's get to the job in hand. So first things first, let's get this machine stripped down. And we'll start by taking off the tool head. Interestingly, the scriber is held on by these quick release screws that have stop nuts on them. So I can't help wondering if different scribers were available for it at one point. And the same is true of this ratchet and drum mechanism. Incidentally, it's this mechanism that allows you to vary the line lengths. 
Those depressions in the drums there work in conjunction with some stops. The drum is indexed around once per stroke and the stops fall into those grooves giving you longer lines. This long screw here affects the stroke length. This is the click for the ratchet mechanism and these are the adjustable stops. Where some of these components have been in place so long, they've actually protected the metal underneath from being tarnished and stained. And we're starting to see a glimpse of what the metal underneath looks like. So I'm excited to get these parts cleaned up. I don't want to affect the surface finish if I can help it. So I'm going to be using auto sole and some very fine wire wool. Now there are a couple of different approaches you could take here. I could of course polish a component like this to within an inch of its life so that it looks brand new again, but that's not the approach I want to take. Instead, I just want to remove the dirt, the grime and the years of tarnish, but leaving enough patina on the part so that it retains some of its original character. This is an old machine after all, and I want it to look like one. So after some considerable elbow grease, this is what we're left with. Interestingly, the material here is not brass as I first thought. Judging by the colour, it looks to be machined from solid bronze or possibly gunmetal, which is an alloy of tin, copper and zinc, and is favoured for its strength and machinability. Returning to the theme of maintaining the character of the machine, I've chosen to leave in place witness marks such as these, which to me only add to the story of the machine and its use throughout history. The staining on some of these parts was so stubborn that I had to resort to the use of Scotch-Brite. Although I did restrict the use of this to the steel parts only because they should be hard enough that the original surface finish of the parts shouldn't be affected. These two components are the brackets that hold the stops to the workhead. And as I work my way through cleaning these components, you can see that they're all made of solid bronze, which speaks to the quality of the original machine. So let's crack on with breaking down the lead screw and slide assembly. First by removing the handle from the hand wheel and then the stop assembly from the hand wheel. Machines of this period often use these holes for tightening components and these were used with a Tommy bar for leverage. Of course, I didn't have one, so I just turned up some silver steel to fit the holes. So that's the legs and the table cleaned up. Still got a lot of staining, but I think it looks a lot better and it just adds a bit of character, eh? So I'll start to rebuild the table assembly and we'll clean up the rest of the components as we rebuild the machine.
Here we have the slide assembly and we've got these two steel springs on the front here. These I'll remove and clean up separately. These are cleaning up quite nicely as you can see from the one on the left here. Then we can clean up the slide assembly itself and refit the springs. That's come out reasonably nicely so we can refit it now to the slide on the bed. Now moving on to the hand wheel ratchet and lead screw mechanism. It looks to me like the lead screw is a press fit into the hand wheel hub, which I would have to remove to disassemble the ratchet mechanism. I'm reluctant to do so in case I break something. The ratchet mechanism is working just fine, so there's no need to completely disassemble it. So I'm gonna do my best just to clean around it. These two screws here incidentally are used to hold in place the stops that sets the travel of the workhead. And it's this travel which dictates the distance between the graduations you're going to be scribing. And here we can see the contrast between the dirty side of the wheel and the bit that's just been polished. And I'm quite pleased with the way that that's coming up. So there we have it, the completed machine. And now I'm itching to give it a test. First things first, I need to get some work mounted to the table. And the existing work holding tabs there leave a bit to be desired. They look like a bit of an afterthought to me. So I'm just gonna remove them and clamp a piece of brass directly to the table. Next, we have to set our distance between the graduations. So I'll set the stops on the hand wheel. I've set the stop to interact with the centre wheel on the drum. This will give us a slightly longer line every five lines and then an even longer line every ten lines. This is because when the stop drops into one of those recesses, you get a slightly longer stroke on the scriber. So let's start making some lines. After each line has been scribed, I advance the hand wheel, which moves the work head along by the given distance as it's coupled directly to the lead screw. And at the end of each stroke, the drum is advanced by one click.
And this is our final result. You can see here we've got a longer line every five graduations and an even longer line every 10. The way I had the machine configured on this initial run means that the line length differences aren't that great, but this is of course configurable. And there it is, from a dusty box at an auction to a fully functional piece of Victorian precision, ready for its next chapter. I absolutely love this machine, and I hope Brandon will get as much enjoyment from using this machine as I've had from bringing it back to life. I've only got one more job to do, and that's to build a packing crate for this machine, so that hopefully it makes it safely to America. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't make it there entirely unscathed. But to find out more about that, you'll have to watch Brandon's video, and I'll leave a link to that in the description. Before I sign off, I've got one more thing to show you. And that's the gift I received from Mike and Hazel at Crinova Engineering. It's got this beautifully machined but curious looking tool head on it and a removable cap with a screw underneath. So what is it? Well, the answer to that becomes clear when you take a look at the business end. Adjusting the screw moves these hardened steel hexagonal jaws in and out. It is, in fact, an adjustable Allen key. And this is an amazing addition to my tool collection. I work on both Imperial and metric machines, and this is going to be a big time saver in hunting around for the correct Allen keys. But in addition to that, I often come across, especially with older machines, badly worn Allen bolts, meaning that the Allen keys are often very loose. And this tool is going to be a real game changer in that application. It really is a well designed, beautifully manufactured and completely unique tool, and I shall treasure it for many years to come. So a big thanks goes out to Mike and Hazel at Cronover Engineering. And if you'd like to see how this tool is designed and manufactured, I shall leave a link to their video in the description. If you've enjoyed today's video and you'd like to support the channel, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Jonesy Makes. If you'd like to leave us a like and a subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the next one.